Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the latest episode of the Stephen King podcast. This is another bonus episode, a, a writer's interview. And this time I have with me a returning guest, and that is Joanne McLean. Hello, Joanne. How are you doing? Hey, Lou. I'm doing great. How are you? Awesome. Thank you. And the last time we talked, you were on the island of uh, Demon Island off That's of Vancouver. Right. That's right. And you're still there? I am. They won't, they won't let right. me go. <laughs> or they haven't kicked me out yet, I should say. <laughs> right. And so how how are things on the island? Oh, well, they're super quiet. It's, uh, you mm. know, with all the COVID protocols, people are pretty much staying right. in their homes. But uh, hopefully it will open up and get back to normal soon. Right. And has things changed at all for you since uh, we talked in fe- February in terms of COVID? Or have you gone out a bit more? Or are you still pretty well locked down? We opened up for a brief period of time in July. So we were back Mm. to no masks and being able to meet indoors. It was almost completely back to normal. And then the Delta variant took hold. And now we're back to masks and half Mm. limits and buildings. And so, yeah, we're back down into a lockdown type. Not as bad as it was originally, but um, it is the the health authorities, public health authorities are saying that the the level of infection is finally leveling out. So Mm. they anticipate being able to remove some of the restrictions end of this month timeframe. Right. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, we'll have to see how it goes. Hopefully this fourth wave will uh, peter out. Yeah. (laughs) We'll have to see. uh, And now they're talking about regular flu is going to make a comeback this year. So (laughs) yeah, yeah, they've got to. Oh, yeah, it never ends. How is it with you? Is it? How's your COVID? Well, uh, you've probably heard through the news, Alberta and Saskatchewan have the highest rates. So it's a lot of people were ignoring it over the summer and nobody was wearing masks in stores and whatnot. And now that's all back again. So yeah, it's, it's hasn't been good. And I hope, hopefully maybe by next spring, this will have been tamped down or at least brought down to uh, what are acceptable levels, but it's, it's pretty bad right now. Our hospitals are overcrowded and that, so... Yeah, that's very bad. That's yeah. unfortunate. Well, I hope it improves too. Yeah. So what that does, though, is it gives people a lot more time to read. And that's that good. is something that you're doing. You're you're writing these books for people to read. And just a little non sequitur before we go into that. Since you live on an island, I'm just curious, have you watched Midnight Mass on Netflix? I have not. Mm, Mid- I'm going to write that down. Midnight Mass. Yes, yes. It's, about- it's the latest. It's the latest series done by for Netflix by Mike Flanagan, who did the uh, Haunting of Hill House and Bly Manor oh, okay. series. So, it's about a, a island where a priest comes back onto the island, and strange things start to happen. So, it's pretty intense at times. And uh, I, I just thought because you lived on an island, you might uh, relate to it a bit more. Than- <laughs> <laughs> than the average viewer. So uh, I just wanted to see if you'd check that out. But I highly recommend to you and to all our listeners that they check that out because Mike Flanagan, of course, has done a couple of Stephen King adaptations, Gerald's Game and Dr. Sleep, so, which were both fantastic. So I highly recommend both of those as well. Excellent. I will check that out for sure. All right. So let's get the ship back on course now. And <laughs> we we had you on back, as I mentioned, on episode 31, back last February, when you were talking about the Gift Legacy series. And for our listeners, if they want to do a, a deeper dive into uh, Joanne's background, I uh, recommend that you listen to that episode. But for new listeners, and just to refresh everybody's memory, Joanne, why don't you give your elevator pitch of yourself and tell us who you are and what you do? Oh, thanks, Lou. Well, my name is Joanne McLean. I use JP as my um, my writing name because Joanne is spelt so many different ways. And I write full-time supernatural thrillers and urban fantasy from my home on this little tiny island called Denman on the west coast of Canada. All righty. And your last series, that, as I mentioned previously, was The Gift Legacy. And that one is, you completed that one, though if I remember correctly, you said you did leave some backdoor openings in case you ever decided to go back to that series. Oh, good memory. Yes, I did. <laughs> I haven't gone back to it at this point. I'm mm. moving forward with the second 
second book in the next series that we'll talk about a bit later today. Right. Yeah, that series is seven books. The first mm-hmm. book being Secret Sky. This is the gift legacy. And mm-hmm. um, the interesting book in this series, that, well, the interesting thing I think about the series is there's a book called uh, Lover Betrayed, which is Secret Sky written from the protagonist's lover's perspective. So it's a, a ta- it's the same book written again in a different uh, character's perspective. And that was mm-hmm. fun to write, very much right. fun to write. Yeah, that was very cool when we talked about that. Uh, that was uh, something definitely unique. And I'm kind of surprised that more authors don't do that. But uh, it's good for you. So let's turn turn now to your new series, which is the the series called Bloodmark? Or is that just the name of the, f- the first book? It's both. I'm going okay. to name the series Bloodmark as well as the first okay. book Bloodmark. Yeah. All right. And what's uh, Bloodmark all about? Well, this is the elevator pitch for Bloodmark, and okay. it's, it's it's not out till next Tuesday, so it's really mm. fresh. So and that's October... the protagonist in this nineteenth, October nineteenth, right. Tuesday, October nineteenth. Okay. The protagonist in this book, her name is Jane Walker. So the elevator pitch is: Jane Walker survives the back alleys of Vancouver, marked by a chain of blood red birthmarks that snake around her body. During her tortured night, she is gripped by agonizing nightmares where she sees into the past. It isn't until one by one the marks begin to disappear that she learns the deadly truth. Her marks are the only things keeping her alive. Mm, intriguing. Uh, are these marks birthmarks or tattoos? or? She thinks they're birthmarks, but she's going to learn that they are blood marks. Blood mark. And that is something different than a birthmark. Mm, and what exactly is a blood mark? Blood mark is a ritually conferred mark that you get if somebody is trying to protect you. Mm. And you have to figure out what you're being protected from before your mark disappears. Okay. And that's an intriguing concept. And is this based on existing folklore or is this something that you've conjured up in your own fertile imagination? <laughs> no, I blame my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally conjured up. <laughs> oh, okay. Were there any other works that you drew um, inspiration from for this? or? Well, you know, what started me thinking about this was actually the opening scene from the show called Blind Spot, where oh, the yes. woman comes yes. out of the duffel bag completely tattooed from her neck down. Right. That scene stuck in my head, and mm. I, I thought, oh, that is interesting. Mm. And so that's part of the inspiration. But so many different little interesting tidbits fed into it. I, I really like the idea of the time slip or time travel, where if you go back in time and change one tiny little thing, mm-hmm. the repercussions through history. Mm-hmm. And I, I in the book, I describe it in reference to a chair. Jane is sitting in a, a wooden chair, maple or pine. I can't remember what the wood was, but the discussion was if you were to change something in history then the seed may not have been fertilized and the conditions may not have been appropriate for that tree to grow the plans or the architect may not have been able to design or may not have designed it about it in reference to a chair that jane is sitting in and the discussion around that is if the seed for that plant wasn't germinated if the conditions weren't right for that seed to grow into the tree that got cut down and designed and built into that chair then you might not be sitting in a chair you might be sitting in a chair of a different design or made of a different kind of wood Mm -hmm. and i like the idea that if you go back in time and you accidentally do something how does that how does that play out in history. So it's kind of like the butterfly effect, you know, right. where yep. a butterfly batting its wings creates a tornado someplace else. And so it was fun to play with those elements in mm-hmm. that story. So that was another little tidbit that played into it. And the other thing I really wanted to do was I was consciously making this character quite different from the character from the gift series. So I, right. I've made Jane much more vulnerable and coming from a lower socioeconomic part of the city, raised as an orphan and tough. Mm. You know, she fights with knives and and knows the seedy underbelly of the city. Mm. Interesting. And that's, that, of course, is set in Vancouver, which you are close to, or are you actually? <laughs> yes, yes, not too far. It's about a ferry ride or two, but okay. I used to live in Vancouver. I lived there for 10 uh, years, so oh, okay. I, I lived right I lived right downtown, so I, uh, you know, I'm quite familiar with the downtown east side and the rougher parts of the city for sure. Right, right, which is good because fans out there will jump on you if you get some of those details wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's I actually really love setting the stories in Vancouver and being able to, you know, talk about streets and stores and and things that people do in Vancouver because that's I get a lot of fans that write and say, "Oh, I just love reading about the things that I recognize." Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it ends a, it lends an air of authenticity to the story when the and, and a setting can be so very important to stories as well. So. Oh, I think so too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So this is another series that you're starting. How has the process of this series for you differed from the Gift Legacy series? Uh, like, is there any lessons learned that you're carrying forward from the previous series into this one? Yeah, a few for sure. I've moved. I don't do a lot of pantsing anymore, like uh-huh. the organic writing. I I try to. I don't stick to the outline necessarily, but I do know where the book is going. So when I start writing, I generally have a fairly extensive outline going forward. Mm -hmm. And then if, if as I'm writing it, some new ideas pop up, then I will change the outline. I won't change the story direction, but I will change the outline. So, so that's, that's carried on. The other thing that I continue to do is I do create the series Bible when Mm. I start. So I have a document that, describes what each character looks like and their relationships to the other characters and i i put all the locations in there too so i know what the bar looks like that she hangs out at and what her apartment looks like and Mm. the distance between them and and i actually have maps of vancouver and i've got (laughs) little little dots where where they where they live because she's in kitsilano this time which is a a neighborhood just barely outside the downtown Mm. and she works at a the place that I've named positively plants, but people that live in <laughs> Vancouver will will know it by a different name. And I, I understand now it has actually moved out of the downtown. So only mm. people who used to know about it will know about it. Oh, okay. Very but good. The bar is the bar is totally made up. It's called Riptide and it's just a fun bar that she <laughs> she goes to. Right. Is it on the waterfront or <laughs> not this one. No, no in okay. the last one there was a bar on the waterfront called Oh, Eddie's. Eddies. Fast Eddies. Fast and Eddies. This one is Riptide. Okay. All all water related themes. <laughs> so it's interesting. It sounds like you're much more meticulous in your approach this time. Yeah. the The first book in the last series was a total. I just started with one scene mm-hmm. and built the built the story out from that one scene and surprised myself more than anyone that that I ended up with a book. This one I purposely move forward with what I imagined would be a good story and it, mm-hmm. it it's i'm getting really good early reviews on it so i'm very very happy with with what it's uh shaping up to be right now oh cool and do you have an idea of how many books are going to be in this series i can see two more for sure mm-hmm. so there's one there's one story arc that will definitely carry through to three mm. i haven't imagined the third book's main storyline yet so i've got the second one almost figure it out i i have some middle bits that i'm not sure of yet right and if i can't by the time i'm writing that second book if i can't come up with full bodied story for a third story then i'd, I'd wrap it up at the second i wouldn't stretch it out if i didn't have enough right. material to to make it really interesting because i like each book to be a complete story totally entertaining and not have to read another book to get to get to feel satisfied that you've had right. a good read right and is this is this a ya novel or series or yeah it could it i mean there are some adult themes in it mm-hmm. uh, one of the one of the characters is a prostitute okay but i think and i'm not sure what the age range is i'm i'm sure people that are 15 16 years old and up would be fine with it right right and is jane jane walker is she how old is she she's 25 25 okay because you have another character i'm seeing here uh sadie who's a teenager no sadie's not a teenager uh, she oh She's not a teenager, but they they get together when they, they get to be good friends when they're teenagers. Oh, okay. But by the time the book starts, they're tw- they're both about twenty five years oh, old. Oh, okay, I see. And she's the hooker. Sadie's the hooker. Right. So she has to be a bit older. Okay, so I'm curious about their relationship and how are you approaching these two characters? Do you strictly write from Jane's POV, or do you sometimes use Sadie's? No, this book is completely different from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas the first series was completely written from Emmeline Taylor's perspective, mm-hmm. I've I've moved into the third person with this series. Oh, okay. And, and there are three perspectives. So there's Jane's perspective and Sadie's perspective, and mm-hmm. they each have different chapters. Okay. And then there's this, the perspective of the the doctor who is 
known by known to both of them by different names. Mm. And the relationship between Sadie and Jane is that they're both orphans and they were raised in the child welfare system. And so they met in a group home. And because of Jane's marks, she has marks on her face. Because of that, she, of course, had been bullied and ostracized. Mm -hmm. And it's Sadie, who is beautiful, who comes to her defense. And together they become fierce friends Mm -hmm. and uh, best friends. And they get an apartment together when they get out of the system. And they work their way out of the the rooming house that they rent and into a, an apartment in Kitsilano, which isn't a great apartment, but it's way better than what they had. So mm-hmm. they are the best of friends, very close. And Sadie is the only one who knows some of the supernatural things that are happening to Jane. Okay. And what are those supernatural things? She dreams of the past. Mm-hmm. So in the pa- when she falls asleep, She has dreams about people she knows, and she sees things happening to them or them doing things, and it's always bad things. So it would be a friend she knows from school, you know, getting hit by a a parent or an uncle or an aunt or um, abuse of some kind. And she wakes up terrified from these dreams because she knows these people, and she knows by the time she's a teenager, she knows these events actually did happen in the past in these people's lives. Mm. And as she gets further and further into the story and and the older she gets the more the dreams become real so when she's a kid the dreams are just black and white movies and there's no sound Mm. and as she gets older she starts to hear their voices and she starts to feel the temperature in the room and she starts to be able to feel the clothing that she's got on her pajamas and stuff Mm -hmm. at the time so her dreams are getting more intense and that plays right into the storyline okay and i guess you don't want to give away whether or not she is able to actually start interacting with these people that she's seeing in these dreams. I think people need to read the, the book. book. To find that out. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, that's uh, there. You go. There's a good hook for you for you listeners to, to read the book. And so she meets a, a third character, uh, Ethan. That's not the doctor, yes. is it? Yeah, that's no. no. No, Ethan is the first man that she's ever met that actually doesn't seem to notice her birthmarks. Mm. And so that she thinks that it is uh, a turning point in her life because she's finally found a man that doesn't judge her for that. Right. And yeah, so he he is a bartender at Riptide, Mm. as it turns out. He's also a, a biker and she is a biker as well because she discovered when she first put on a motorcycle helmet and pulled the visor down she realized that she could hide Mm. her marks from the world and get on a bike and just love the freedom of it so they both they have that in common the bike right angle okay and how much do you know about motorcycles i i don't know a lot (laughs) and in my acknowledgements i had to thank my girlfriend's buddy because he has a bike. He's got a Harley. So he mm. was he was giving me the lingo <laughs> right. that I needed because yep. I didn't know what a two-up ride was, but mm-hmm. now I do. There you go. So, yeah. well, that's Are good. you a biker? No, I'm not. Do you not. have a bike? No, no, no. I've been on a bike once. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Motorcycle <laughs> once. It was fun, but it's just not my thing. So it's just a little too dangerous for my liking. I, I'm just curious because if you don't know the bike stuff, then that's again like the Vancouver city layout. Uh, if you don't know your bike lingo and models and terminology, there's going to be people coming after you for sure. So, <laughs> well, I hope I got it right. Yeah. It's a good thing that you've got an expert resource. So yeah. 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 But you know, if I, if I did get it wrong, I, uh, it's not his fault. It's completely my fault. I, I would have misinterpreted if I've gotten it wrong. But hope, mm-hmm. hope I haven't. Right. So when you, you created these two characters, Jane and Sadie, like Sadie is, a, you know, obviously a support person for, or I guess they are a support person for each other. Yes. But from a story perspective, what is Sadie there just to bounce Jane's inner thoughts off of? Or what, what, what is, is, does Sadie no. have any skin in this game or beyond friendship? Yeah. Actually, that's a line I use in the, in the book. Uh-huh. She does have skin in the game. She doesn't realize it at first. Mm. And Jane doesn't either. It's all connected to this murky person that they're both connected to. But they don't know they're both connected to that uh, person until okay. later in the story. Uh-huh. But she is, a, she is a catalyst in this. Uh, she puts a ball in motion that she didn't even realize she was putting in motion and feeds mm. into it unknowingly. So it, it's a, it strains their friendship. 
Mm. Yeah. And I don't want to give too much more away. Okay. Uh, fair enough. And so this this book, as you mentioned earlier, is coming out on October 19th. As we're recording, today is the 13th. So that's not too far away. Hopefully this this episode will get out in time so people can just go from the podcast to, to go and pick up your book. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and since you're already working on the second book, does that have a, a working title? It does have a working title, Ghost Mark. Mm. But that's just the working title. Don't okay. be surprised if that changes. I'm yeah. I'm getting titles or getting titles right is not my forte. I'll mm -hmm. be passing that one along to get some feedback on. And the third book, just as a joke, I'm calling question mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a there's a theme there. That's good. That uh, that's good. You're you're into your second book right now, and what what's what's the length of uh, of the first book? I'm thinking it's ninety thousand words. Okay. That's pretty so good length, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty good length. Mm -hmm. The second book will be about the same. I tend to write books that are at least that, mm -hmm. if not longer. But yeah, that that one is is ninety thousand. I I did I did anticipate I might be able to get some interest from traditional publishing people with this book, but that didn't pan out. Mm -hmm. So it I did aim for a smaller size because they they tend to want eighty thousand words. Right. But um, but I went over that, so it's mm -hmm. ninety ninety two something like that. Right. Right. So it, would you turn this new series then an urban fantasy or is it a thriller or like what would you? It's much more in a, like a supernatural thriller. Okay. Um, when I think of urban fantasy, I think, you know, I, I think that people might be misconstrued to think that it's more like a vampire a werewolf type thing. And it's it's definitely not. It's a little bit of time slip and mm -hmm. ghost and supernatural or paranormal activity is is what it is and it's very fast paced so that's why i put the thriller in there because it does zip along at a very very fast pace okay and you mentioned that jane's good with knives how did that come about well i i recall thinking about well biker boots and the knives that you can mm -hmm. get to to hide in biker boots but i i wanted her to be able to defend herself in a way that was not necessarily a physical way mm -hmm. so that she would have expertise in in defending herself that way. I just wanted her to be edgy and dangerous and I thought that was a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. And I I guess that's all the questions I had. Is there anything that you wanted to say about this new series that hasn't come up yet? Oh, no, uh, you've, you've done very well covering the bases. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm impressed. Okay, that's, that's good. It's, it sounds very intriguing, and I, I wish you all the best with it. And once again, Bloodmark is out October 19th. They, buyers can find it on your website and at all the usual places, Amazon, Kobo, or Chapters and whatnot. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. it's wide. Sometimes they have to put my initials in, J.P. McLean, M-C-L-E-A-N, to find it. But yeah, Bloodmark okay. is out, and I'm real excited about it. Okay, well, it sounds like a very intriguing series, and I wish you all the best with it. Thanks so much, Lou. Great not, to be here. Yes, not a problem. Great to have you back on. I guess we'll be talking sometime down the road when the second book comes out. Thanks so much. I'd okay, love to. thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.